diencephalon, one of the two major divisions of the forebrain. It's made up of four main components, the thalamus, the subthalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The thalamus assists in sensory perception, regulation of motor functions, and control of sleep and wake cycles. It's known as the information relay station. It also occupies the central portion of the diencephalon. It's a void of shape and about four centimeters long. It's connected to all areas of the cerebral cortex. Then there's the hypothalamus, which is the control center for many autonomic functions through the release of hormones. The epithalamus, which is in the posterior area of the diencephalon that includes the penile gland. And it aids in the sense of smell and helps to regulate sleep-wake cycles. The subthalamus assists in motor control. It's also located within the diencephalon is the third ventricle, one of the four brain ventricles or cavities filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And also, the diencephalon is primarily made up of brain nuclei or gray matter. Let's talk about the function of the diencephalon. It relays sensory information between brain regions and controls many autonomic functions of the peripheral nervous system. It connects structures to the endocrine system with the nervous system and works in conjunction with limbic system structures to generate and manage emotions and memories. Several of the functions of the body include directing, directing sense impulses throughout the body, autonomic function control, which was previously mentioned, endocrine function control, also previously mentioned, motor function control, homeostasis, and then, of course, our senses, hearing, vision, smell, taste, and touch perception. The diencephalon is primarily situated between the cerebral hemispheres, superior to the midbrain. Another way to find the diencephalon is to look in the telencephalon, which is where it is embedded. The borders of the diencephalon include the rostral optic ch chasm, the caudally mammillary bodies, and the dorsal thalami. Like previously said, the diencephalon is associated with the third ventricle, which surrounds the inner thalamic adhesion. A nerve related to the diencephalon would be the optic nerve in the fiber type SSA. Where do the accents of the optic nerve arise would be a question someone asked, and that would be the retinal ganglion cells. Let's talk about some medical implications associated with diencephalon. The first would be the diencephalic syndrome. It's a rare disorder caused by a tumor that's usually located in the diencephalon, a portion of the brain just above the brainstem, which, as already said, it affects infants and young children, who, and it may develop symptoms that include the failure to gain weight and grow, as would be expected based upon age and gender, which is also known as failure to thrive and abnormal progressive thinness and weakness. Affected infants and children may behave in an alert, happy, and outgoing manner, which is in contrast to their outward appearance. Additional symptoms such as vomiting, vision abnormalities, headaches, and pallor can also develop. Diencephalic syndrome can progress to cause severe life-threatening complications. And then another disease or implication that we could associate with diencephalon with the diencephalon would be seizures because of the thalencephalon. If you're wondering what the heavy breathing is in the background, just watch. <sighs> Thanks for watching, that's all folks.
The major landmarks of the limbic system are the tracks along the border of the cerebrum and the diacephalon. An example of the use of the limbic system are many emotional areas. Many examples are rage, fear, pain, sexual arousal, and pleasure. Humans and lions are the only mammals that have sex for pleasure. Without the limbic system, we would not be able to feel any of that. The main reason why the limbic system is important is because it controls behaviors essential to life, such as the desire to eat and drink. It's not only responsible for our emotional lives, but also many higher mental functions, such as learning and formation of memories. So basically, in a nutshell, without this part in our brain, we would not have the ability to take a new information or feel. The amygdala is the emotional center. The thalamus and hypothalamus are associated with changes in emotional reactivity. The cingulate gyrus coordinates smells and sights. The limbic system develops earlier and faster than the cortex, meaning that until the cortex can catch up with the limbic system, the desire for rewards and social pressures overrides rational thinking. When the limbic system develops, this is usually around the per where the person goes through puberty. All major parts of the limbic cell include the amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and the cingulate gyrus. The dysfunctions that are related to the limbic system include increased anger and violence, hyperarousal, which can cause can low energy or lack of drive, appetite dysregulation, trouble forming memories, cognitive disorders such as Alzheimer's, and disinhibited behavior, which means someone doesn't consider the risk of behaviors and ignore social rules. Extensive connections between the limbic system and lower and higher brain regions allow the system to integrate and respond to a variety of environmental stimuli. So in dummy words, you take the lower brain and the higher brain and somehow they connect and voila, that is how the limbic system goes. The cerebellum is the part of the brain at the back of the skull and vertebrae. Its function is to coordinate and regulate muscular activity. The cerebellum appears to play several roles. It stores learned sequences of movements. It participates in fine-tuning and coordination of movements produced elsewhere in the brain. And it interrogates all of these things to produce movements so fluid and harmonious that we are not even aware of them. And as you can tell in this here video, Rainy does not have a strong cerebellum as his movements are not in any way in harmony. He is very klutzy and does not have any sense of balance. People could suffer from cerebellar syndrome where there is damage to the cerebellum regardless of its origin.
For example, if a patient with cerebellar syndrome tries to touch an object, the movement of her hand will begin late, then accelerate beyond what is normal. Okay, we're going to try this exercise. I want you to pick up your tea, please. It can also be too late and inefficient so that her hand ends up missing the object and going past it. This movement then ends with oscillations of the hand and arm. Brain development, neurogenesis, and fate decisions of cerebellar primodurum cells orchestrated through tightly controlled molecular events involving multiple genetic pathways. During the fetal period, the infraternatorial part of the brain is greater than 5% of the total weight from 14 to 17 weeks about 5% from 18 to 29 weeks, and exceeds 6.5% by 40 weeks. Between birth and 9 months, the cerebellum increases from 5.7 to 10% of the total brain weight. Therefore, the growth rate is the same as brain growth overall, and the proportional weight is constant. Anatomists classify the cerebellum as part of the metacephalon, which also includes the pons. The metacephalon, in turn, is the upper part of the Rhombencephalon, or hindbrain, like the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum is divided into two hemispheres. It also contains a narrow midline zone called the vermis. Motor learning. The cerebellum is important for motor learning. The cerebellum plays a major role in adapting and fine-tuning motor programs to make accurate movements through a trial and error process. And here, for example, we have a video of my mother trying to catch a softball and succeeding because of the trial and error process we completed. The part of the brain I will be talking about is the 12 cranial nerves. The olfactory nerve is the sensory nerve for the sense of smell. The optic nerve is the sensory nerve for the receipt of primary visual stimuli. The oculomotor nerve innervates four of the six muscles involved in eye movement and is responsible for elevating the upper eyelid and involved with pupillary constriction. The trochlear nerve is responsible for downward and inward eye movement. The trigeminal is a mixed nerve which is involved in sensations of pain, temperature, and light touch of the entire face, scalp, nose, and mouth, and which innervates the muscles of mastication. The abducens nerve is responsible for rotating the eye laterally, and the facial nerve is a mixed nerve which innervates the muscles of facial expression and is responsible for closing the eyes, smiling, whistling, showing the teeth, wrinkling the nose and brow, and grimacing. It also controls tearing and salivation. The acoustic nerve is involved in the sense of hearing, balance, and orientation in space. The glossopharyngeal nerve is a mixed nerve which innervates the pharynx, taste receptors on the tongue, parotid gland, and the back of the ear. The vagus nerve is a mixed nerve which innervates the soft palate, pharynx, larynx, thoracic, and abdominal organs, including the heart, lungs, and viscera, and external auditory meatus. Spinal accessory nerve is responsible for shrugging the shoulders and rotating the head. And last but not least, the hypoglossal nerve is responsible for normal speech and swallowing. Every one of the nerves is a major part of the brain. Now I'm going to talk about what happens if there's any problems with any nerves in the, in the brain. If there's a problem with your olfactory nerve, you wouldn't be able to smell correctly. And if the optic nerve is damaged, then you wouldn't be able to see perfectly. If the ocular motor nerve is damaged, you wouldn't be able to move your eyelid normally. And if you damage your trochlear nerve, then you couldn't look downward or inward normally. If the trigeminal nerve is damaged, you basically have a much higher pain tolerance, and you won't be able to look side to side if your abducens nerve gets damaged. If your facial nerve gets obliterated, then that means you can't smile, whistle, or close your eyes and you would go deaf if your acoustic nerve got damaged. If your glossopharyngeal nerve got damaged, then you might not be able to tell the difference between sugar and salt with your taste buds. 
You can't rotate your head anymore if your spinal accessory nerve gets damaged. And finally, you could not talk normally if your hypoglossal nerve got damaged. That's all, folks. The midbrain or mesencephalon is a portion of the central nervous system associated with vision, hearing, motor control, sleep wake arousal, and temperature regulation. The brain serves as the pathway for the cerebral hemispheres in the lower brain and as the center for the auditory and visual reflexes. The midbrain processes visual stimuli, integrates visual and auditory motor reflexes, and relays auditory info. The midbrain is part of the brainstem. The brainstem is the stem like part of the base of the brain that is connected to the spinal cord. It regulates autotomic functions, those that the body carries out without conscious thought, such as digestion, heart rate, and breathing rate. During embryonic development, the midbrain arises from the second vesicle, also known as the mesencephalon, of the neural tube. Unlike the other two vesicles, the forebrain and the hindbrain, the midbrain remains undivided for the remainder of neural development. It does not split into other brain areas, while the forebrain, for example, divides into the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The tectum, Latin for roof, makes up the rear portion of the midbrain and is formed by two paired round swellings, the superior and inferior colliculi. The superior colliculus receives input from the retina and the visual cortex and participates in a variety of visual reflexes, particularly the tracking of objects in the visual field. The inferior colliculus receives both crossed and uncrossed auditory fibers and projects upon the medial geniculate body, the auditory relay nucleus of the thalamus. The tegmentum is located in front of the tectum. It consists of fiber tracts in three regions distinguished by their color, the red nucleus, the paraqueductal gray region, and the substantia nigra. The red nucleus is a large structure located centrally within the tegmentum that is involved in the coordination of sensory motor information. The substantia nigra is a large pigmented cluster of neurons that consists of two parts, the pars reticula and the pars compacta. Cells of the pars compacta contain the dark pigment melanin. These cells synthesize dopamine and project to either the quadrate nucleus or the putamen, both of which are structures of the basal ganglia and are involved in mediating movement and motor coordination. The paraaqueductal gray region of the tegmentum is made up of gray matter, neural tissue with relatively few axons covered in myelin, and surrounds the cerebral aqueduct, a short canal that runs between the third and fourth ventricles of the brain. The paraaqueductal gray refers to the function primarily in pain suppression as a result of its naturally high concentrations of endorphins. Also within the midbrain are the cruce cerebri, tracts made up of neurons that connect the cerebral hemispheres to the cerebellum. The midbrain also contains a portion of reticular information, a neural network that is involved in arousal and alertness. Cranial nerves in the midbrain stimulate the muscles controlling eye movement, lens shape, and pupil diameter. The hippocampus plays an important role in short-term memory. The pineal body synthesizes melatonin. The corpus callosum links the two brain hemispheres. Because the midbrain houses the hypothalamus, it plays a major role in autotomic body functions. Damage to the midbrain can result in a wide variety of movement disorders, difficulty with vision and hearing, and trouble with memory. information well more than basic facts what we see here feel and smell area makes sense of what they're saying When I was a child I had a fever My hands felt just like two balloons And now I've got the feeling once again I can't explain and you can't understand why I'm a hippocampus fan.
cerebrum is a large part of the brain containing the cerebral cortex, as well as several subcortical structures including the hippocampus, basal ganglia, and olfactory bulb. In the human brain, the cerebrum is the uppermost region of the central nervous system. The telencephalon is the embryonic structure from which the cerebrum develops prenatally. In mammals, the dorsal telencephalon, or pallium, develops in the cerebral cortex, and the ventral telencephalon, or subpallium, becomes the basal ganglia. The cerebrum is also divided into approximately symmetric left and right cerebral hemispheres. It makes you Your cerebrum got a kick Can you stand up? Unless your frontal lobe is damaged You can Your upper motor neurons send Your lower motor neurons command Because the visual perception areas are in the cerebrum. Out of the corner of my eye. It receives visual stimuli and draws conclusions about what you've seen. I turn to look, but it was gone. I cannot put my finger on it now. The child is grown, the dream is gone. It's not really gone because the hippocampus stores memories, remember? The cerebrum is important because it's a major part of the brain, controlling emotions, hearing, vision, personality, and much more. It controls all voluntary actions. Damage to the primary motor cortex results in paralysis. Damage to the olfactory bulb results in the loss of the sense of smell. Damage to Broca's area results in the inability to speak or expressive aphasia while damage to the Wernick's area results in receptive aphasia, the inability to understand what you're hearing. Damage to the hippocampus can result in loss of memory. Long story short, the cerebrum's important, and without its ability to synthesize auditory stimuli, we wouldn't be able to enjoy the rest of David Gilmour's solo. Oblongata, the part shown in dark green in the photo, is a part of the brain stem which moves all communications, both sensory and motor, between the brain and the spinal cord. For instance, let's say your body encountered a foreign substance that it did not like, where your brain would send a signal through the medulla oblongata to the parts it needed to to cause your body to vomit. Now your body coordinates these activities by having autonomic centers that regulate where the uh, brain signals come in and where they should go. So 
that you can vomit when you need to. Your body needs the medulla oblongata because it connects from the brain to the spinal cord. Without it, the signals that the nerves send in your brain would not go anywhere and we would all basically be paralyzed from the neck down. Now, the medulla oblongata forms in fetal development from the myelencephalon. It can be seen at around 20 weeks. Now, when this is happening, the neuroblast from the neural tube at this level will start to produce the sensory nuclei for the medulla and the basal plates and neuroblasts, sorry that was difficult to say, will create the motor nuclei. Some of these nuclei are important. For instance, the solitary nucleus contains the general visceral afferent fibers which are a part of the taste sense. And another one is the inferior olivary nucleus which helps relay information to the cerebellum. There are two major parts to the mandula oblongata. The ventral or anterior mandula which contains the pyramidal tracts and the CN912 CN rootlets. The next part is the tegmentum or dorsal mandula which contains the cuneate nuclei and the white matter tracts. What do all those terms mean? I'm kind of hazy on it. Dysfunctions of the mandula oblongata can be almost anything that is automatic to your body. That would include heart rate, blood pressure, vomiting, sneezing, well, the stopping of that, not the causing of that. The most common instances of this are dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, or actual choking. There are actually cases of this. 22-year-old female checked, uh, went to a doctor in October of 2012 with a complaint of shortness of breath and frequent choking for a month. They did a lot of examinations to her lower cranial nerves, and they did a CT scan and an MRI and it showed that there was a mass lesion on the dorsal surface of her medulla oblongata and that this was causing her shortness of breath and choking. So the problem turned out to actually be a tumor. So, <laughs> sorry for saying so, so much. So, the woman had a craniotomy and a laminoplasty to get rid of most of the tumor and then they went through with radiotherapy to make sure that they got it all. The good news, if you do have this, is that it's treatable. The person who had this, uh, her latest MRI from her brain and her whole spine done a year later have shown no residual or recurring tumors in in through the entire body. So that's pretty good. The pons is a portion of the brainstem located above the medulla oblongata and below the midbrain. Although it is small, at approximately 2.5 centimeters long, it serves several important functions. It is a bridge between various parts of the nervous system, including the cere cerebellum and the cerebrum, which are both parts of the brain. There are many important nerves that originate in the pons. The trigeminal nerve is responsible for feeling in the face. I also, it also controls the muscles that are responsible for biting, chewing, and swallowing. The abducens nerve allows the eyes to look from side to side. The facial nerve controls facial expressions, and the vestibulocochlear nerve allows sound to move from the ear to the brain. All of these nerves start within the pons. As part of the brain stem, the pons also impact several automatic functions necessary for life. A section of the lower pond stimulates and controls the intensity of breathing, and a section of the upper pond decreases the depth and frequency of breaths. The pond has also been associated with the control of sleep cycles. The pond has two overarching roles. The first is the regulation of breathing. In the pond, there is a structure called the pneumotaxic center. It controls the amount of air breathed and breaths per minute, which is known as the breathing rate. In addition, the pons is involved in the transmission of signals to and from other structures in the brain, such as the cerebrum or cerebellum. The pons is also involved in sensations such as hearing, taste, and balance. Finally, the pons is involved in the regulation of deep sleep, as I had mentioned before. There is a syndrome known as locked-in syndrome. This is a 
condition resulting from interruption of motor pathways in the pons, usually by infarction. This disconnection of the motor cells in the lower brainstem and spinal cord from controlling signals issued by the brain leaves the patient completely paralyzed and mute, but able to receive and understand some sensory stimuli to the thalamus. Nice. The pons begins to form around week three or four of embryonic development, and then it is actually one of the last things to be fully formed. You know, not even happening until after the baby is born. Oh. Here's an interesting recent fact for you. There is a new finding in the development of the pons in human fetuses. Here is a quote. Morphometric and histological studies of the pons were performed by light micros microscopy in 28 cases of externally normal human fetuses ranging from 90 to 246 millimeters in crown rump length and from 13 to 28 weeks of gestation. Interesting. And then by using the transpontinal approach, evaluation of the fetal pons is feasible via the mid-sagittal plane. The nomograms developed and the ratio to fetal vermes provides reference data that may be helpful when evaluating anomalies of the brainstem. Neat.